Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, Dan O'Prey and Daniel Feichtinger. They are uh, the CEO and CTO of a project called Hyperledger. Now, Hyperledger has been sort of on our radar for a while. Uh, Tim Swanson was telling us for a while ago to, to do an episode on that, and our interest was sort of renewed in that recently when we heard a, an excellent episode on Beyond Bitcoins about the Internet of Money with Tim Swanson and, uh, and Meher Roy. So we're really excited um, to talk about this today. I think it's, um, it's an interesting project. So uh, Dan and uh, Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for having us. Great to be here. Um, so to get started, can you just tell us briefly what what is Hyperledger trying to accomplish? Okay. Um, yeah, generally, I would say that we're not, you know, often uh, as a starting point, people assume that we're trying to be a Bitcoin competitor or a counterparty competitor. Uh, and I would say that we don't really generally view ourselves as being a direct competitor. We're not trying to replace Bitcoin. It's more for different scenarios. Uh, so we're particularly looking at financial services and, and more private deployments where there are already groups of uh, groups of institutions or companies uh, who need to have a shared data layer that need to have it more private from the, the public. Uh, so Hyperledger is designed to be very, very modular. Uh, it's just a straightforward consensus uh, system where everyone, a set known of, of uh, parties can participate in the consensus process. Uh, and all have access to the same universal record of truth, uh, without that being more generally public to the uh, yeah, to the public. Well, it strikes me interesting about this project is it's, it's trying to accomplish one very basic thing. You know, the, the feature set is quite simple. I've been playing around with it quite a bit in the command line and everything, and actually like even going through the source code, and I was just surprised at how how little how little features there are. It just one does one thing and does it really well, right? Yep, that was absolutely our, our goal in, in building this, um, was, was exactly that approach. Um, we feel some other projects kind of take on, they're very complex, very involved, um, very interesting, but um, we really want to, to and, and we do want to tackle kind of uh, different parts of, of the stack in the future, but uh, that was very much our approach was Let's just take the, the ledger layer, the kind of consensus process over the ledger layer and the kind of authentication and um, signatures, the access control over the accounts, um, and just really build uh, a, a neat, robust solution for that um, before we kind of move on to different different points in the stack. Yeah, we want to take a very modular approach. So, um, yeah, some platforms have a, a lot of features, and that's fantastic. But um, it sort of makes assumptions over how it's going to be used. And if you need to actually, if you want to adopt the system, and, and you might have to re-architect a lot of your, your existing systems and integrate them. Uh, so having to replace too much at once can be quite a large barrier, barrier of adoption to some entities. Uh, so by having a more modular approach, you can fit in you know, we really just wanted to strip it down just to the, the, the shared data layer, fit that in as a module with existing systems, and then we can work from there to replace other parts. Right. Also, I mean, yeah. Sorry, I mean, personally, looking at the different projects that are, uh, that are sprouting up, uh, I mean, just generally in the Bitcoin space, I find that the right approach is to have that really modular approach of like, this does one thing, and then other people will come in and develop other uh, feature sets on top of that or interconnect with other projects. So, I mean, I think so far, if projects like Counterparty, for instance, which is nothing, but there's nowhere near what you're trying to accomplish, but is one example where having so many features in there makes it complex and, and difficult to iterate. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's uh, sort of a, a good approach at, at this state, particular stage in the space where things are being built, um, and we're just kind of really early on building all these modules that will kind of fit in together. I mean, one thing that strikes me about Hyperledger, and, and not just Hyperledger, but quite a few of the projects that we've been having on and we've been talking about, is that they feel very, very different from the sort of traditional crypto, uh, you know, cryptocurrency projects and, and projects in the space in that they get, uh, they get rid of uh, a lot of the ideology, a lot of the sort of uh, political ideas behind it that may be a certain barrier, right, especially when it comes to getting uh, 
companies and corporations to adopt that and then sort of say, oh, let's use some of the innovation here, some of these blockchains and, and decentralized technologies, but then let's also throw out other ones, especially uh, the idea that it's controlled by an uh, anonymous network of nodes and, and sort of pack, you know, take, take some of it and now create a sort of consensus as a service. You now that term has often been used, so we create basically business solutions with that. Yeah, we, we see it as a technology. It's not a political movement. Um, yeah, I'm sympathetic to the views behind Bitcoin, uh, but yeah, there are wider use cases which don't, you know, don't start from those starting assumptions. And I think that the starting assumptions really is quite key, um, in particular with Bitcoin, where you, you assume that you know, based on history with uh, hash cash and e gold, uh, that you know the government might attempt to take it down. So it needs to be as decentralized as possible. Therefore, you need to incentivize anonymous miners. Uh, and so you need a cryptocurrency built in, and, and that makes perfect sense when you start from that starting assumption. Um, so you know, something that people often say is, you know, we love the blockchain, hate Bitcoin, and I know that annoys a lot of people in the space uh, because uh, a token built in is required for a maximally distributed blockchain. Uh, but when you're not trying to, you know, don't start with that assumption that you need maximum decentralization. Uh, then you don't necessarily need a cryptocurrency built in, and you can have just that that core technology amongst um, a known set of people, rather than having to have anonymous miners joining and leaving the pool. Right. That's, so that's also one of the the key characteristics of Hyperledger. You know, is that there is no hyper coin, hyper token, nothing like that. Exactly. Just a just a shared uh, data layer. Um, no no built in cryptocurrency. No built in you know, central exchange. Uh, it's purely just the straightforward layer that anyone who wants to have, yeah, just a, a blockchain uh, as it is, can can take and use. So it, it seems another project that is trying to sort of target the more business use case and financial use case is Ripple. How do you guys think you're trying to accomplish something similar, or do you think uh, Hyperledger is a, a very different project? Uh, Ripple are probably the most similar to us in terms of both in terms of the consensus process uh, and the general approach to the space. Um, yeah, the key difference is obviously they've got XRP, the cryptocurrency built in as a native asset, um, and we don't. Um, they are very much focused on the correspondent banking side of things. Um, to do that, they have one big public network. Uh, which links up all the gateways and institutions to allow uh, exchange between Nostra accounts and, and international settlement between banks. Uh, we're looking more at the private side where you know, people don't want that on a big public network. They don't want all their accounts and balances and, and open positions and trades to be, to be visible. Um, so it is similar, but I'd say yeah, the, the focus is very different. It seems besides the issue of, of compensating anonymous miners and sort of paying for the decentralization in that way, uh, another function of native tokens is uh, you know paying for transaction fees, and and I guess sort of related to that is also the issue of uh, of kind of spam protection, right? To, that make it actually cost something, and that seems very sensible. Uh, is there a role for that in Hyperledger? Uh, so by default, Hyperledger doesn't have any transfer fees. So if you you set up your own pool, you can just transfer freely uh, within that. Um, the notion that you know that the, the pools will be spammed um, makes sense when you again when you have an open network like Ripple, where anyone can join and create an account and create IOUs and do you know, worthless transfers, and that that could be an issue. Uh, when you are looking more at the private side, if you've got a, a group of banks or a group of partner companies who are known. Um, either they're spamming each other money, which will be you know, perfectly acceptable, um, or there'll be you know, you know there isn't really any incentive for them to to try and spam. So it really, if you yeah, again, it's the starting assumptions. If it's restricted to just known identities and people who are collaborating and, and already trust themselves in the real world for to some extent, uh, then the likelihood of spam is a lot less to zero. Uh, and I'd say also beyond that. Um, just charging for transactions isn't necessarily the best way to get rid of spam. Uh, I know that the popular example is around sort of email coin. You know, people get a lot of spam. If you just charge a little bit per email, then, then spam will go away. 
uh, but that's not necessarily true. Um, for example, uh, you know, with sending postage mail, you have to buy a stamp, but you still you still send a lot of spam. And then uh, also with email newsletters, where you know you need to send out mass emails to charge just a little bit for that can add up to a lot. Um, so I don't think that just charging. Uh, is the solution necessarily to spam, and there can be more sophisticated technological uh, approaches through software, through blacklisting, graylisting, um, and you're yeah, barring known spammers. Uh, I'd say as well one of our differences from uh, Bitcoin um, is that that once you uh, kind of if you give up some of the the massive decentralization, the kind of massive anonymity, and you get rid of mining and things. Um, you know, you can actually processing a transaction becomes very cheap, very easy to run. Run one of these servers is it's a pretty lightweight process. Um, in fact, we're we're hoping that kind of one server could be engaged in multiple of these kind of consensus pools. You know, kind of completely independently at the same time on the same machine. Um, so I, I'd say the other side of our thing is the other side of our vision is that we'd rather get transaction processing and um, you know checking accounts and validation and all that. Uh, down to be as simple and lightweight as possible. So our threshold for what we can tolerate and what counts as spam on our system should be, uh, you know, relatively a lot lower. So that's interesting. So you mentioned that potentially you could have s multiple nodes on the same system. Um, the, yeah. So the same the same server could be engaged in, um, you know, through the use of machines or. Or something could be participating in the consensus process for multiple different pools at the same time. Oh, okay. So for multiple pools of assets. Okay. So um, mm -hmm. just just to sort of sum up what what you were saying. So the the, the fundamental difference with uh, with a system like Bitcoin, for instance, is that your your starting assumptions were different. Your starting assumption is that rather than uh, being in a completely uh, in, a, in a trustless network, uh, you are in a network of participants which you trust, and so the assumption is that you know people working together are not going to be spamming each other. Um, that might work in some cases, but it may not in others. Is, is there, so in, in some scenario where transaction fees could be desirable, is, that, is it possible to implement those uh, to fight spam, for instance, or to, to uh, limit the amount of transactions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one of, those, one of those situations. We've not built it into the protocol. Uh, because depending on what your um, what assets you're dealing with, it doesn't always make sense to to kind of cut it up and and uh, um, you know apportion it around to to combat spam. But you could certainly build in um, either some sort of uh, native um, asset or some sort of uh, in a bunch of different assets which are required in order to to make transfers. Uh, but again, that's that's something that we didn't want to build into the protocol because it's so domain specific. It really depends what you want to do. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely something you could do should you want to. Uh, I think one of uh, one of the interesting things here as well is the the kind of vision for the future. You no, know? because here if we have, uh, you know, because there's the idea, especially for example, connector of sidechains, and we can talk about these big pictures questions a bit more later. There's the idea that will you know there will be sort of one unitary system where Bitcoin and sidechains, etc. Are used to for all kinds of things, right? For microtransactions, to Bitcoin, to perhaps shares, etc. Whereas it seems with Hyperledger, you guys see more a world where there are all kinds of ledgers and all kinds of different consensus networks for a variety of use cases. So it seems like you guys are seeing a world where there will be uh, thousands of different uh, ledgers and consensus systems in the future. Is that correct? I, I believe so, yeah. I, I think the idea that everything will share the same blockchain or essentially the same database, um, whilst it may sort of sound good on the face of it, isn't very practical or even desirable. Um, for example, you know, if you want to have you know, very, very different types of assets, uh, why do they need to be on the same pool and limited to the same number of transactions and have all the same participants? Uh, and again, also in the case of Bitcoin, to have that all you know, completely public, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, obviously, for the, the trustability and auditability of the Bitcoin blockchain, it needs to be public, uh, and that makes sense for sort of the, you know, the Bitcoin token where you can. Uh, hide who the, the ownership are through multiple accounts, um, but for their institutional usage, you, 
you know, you, it's too easy for you know, if you're Goldman Sachs to have Morgan Stanley doing data analysis and see, finding out which accounts are yours and, and how much of what assets you own uh, and seeing what you know, trade you're doing, uh, and that's just sort of not acceptable to to larger institutions. Um, so we do see very much a world where where there are multiple consensus pools. I still think the Bitcoin blockchain will be you know, one of them and one of the, probably one of the largest. Um, I don't think you know, we're not trying to replace Bitcoin or, or, and don't believe it will go away. Uh, I just don't think it will be all-encompassing for every type of value and every type of, of transaction all across the world, uh, across the board. Um, so yes, definitely there will be what well, we believe there will be, there'll be different consensus pools for different types of assets with different participants. Um, so you could have sort of more of a layered structured approach where it's similar to the current system where you may have an underlying international uh, pool for transfers but then more local trading, uh, more local markets and, and more yeah, private pools and dark pools uh, for trading just amongst particular types of, of participants. Well, so which brings us to our next point of interoperability within the space, right? So this is something we, we've discussed quite a bit on the show and between Brian and I as well. So the, the idea that we have all these different currencies and also so Mayer talks about it uh, uh, with regards to the Internet of, of uh, Money, um, his white paper. So this idea of multiple currencies at, at some point, you know, they have to become interoperable. Uh, they have to be able to um, uh, to operate with each other, how does Hyperledger fit into um, to a world where there are multiple currencies, multiple assets um, distributed across multiple countries, perhaps with different regulatory uh, frameworks, etc.? Uh, how would Hyperledger help in creating um, or eliminating the gaps between them, or is that at so, all? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that we're looking at. So. Um, as I say, I mean, <clears throat> just internally within Hyperledger, a particular pool uh, can have um, as many assets uh, as can be supported by the um, by the servers. So, uh, in that sense, uh, you know, you've kind of an unlimited number of assets that could be recorded in one pool. Um, on beyond that, between multiple Hyperledger instances, uh, we're working on some solutions that it becomes a little bit more complicated when your consensus process is kind of operating on group two. Uh, completely disparate networks, but um, there are some sort of synchronization um, things that you can do to ensure that, um, let's say, I, I, like I, I will make a, uh, an exchange on in one pool, um, you know, and, uh, as long as a, an exchange on the pool happens um, or a transfer on another pool happens, um, there are some ways that you can do that. So, uh, uh, you mentioned. Uh, having multiple assets in one pool, so does that mean, uh, you know, let's say a, a bunch of uh, banks or something, they set up a, a, a one of these pools with these nodes, then they could have a, any number of assets like traded on that, or is it, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, you can have uh, as many as you want. And in fact, our system, so we, uh, conceptually within the Hyperledger model, uh, we consider a, a ledger to record, um, you know, all the balances in all the accounts of one particular fungible asset. So that's, you know, something like a, a currency is is something that you know can be cut up and and uh, moved around quite freely. Um, where I think we differ from some other projects is that obviously it depends. Um, let's say you're setting up a system which is representing uh, bank liabilities. Um, so, you know, my, my bank liabilities at, at, at my, might have a, an account at bank A and I can have an account at bank B, both denominated, say, in euros, um, but we, we would rather model those and set those up as two distinct ledgers. There's the, the one ledger is the liabilities of bank A and one ledger is the liabilities of bank B, even though it's the same currency to you, um, because even though that may trade at, uh, you know, a parity most of the time there are situations in which, say, a bank has some sort of issue or it's in a different jurisdiction where, um, you know, uh, we can see it in, in the kind of, um, in the Eurozone at the moment where it's happened where, uh, you know, a Euro in perhaps a Greek or Cypriot bank uh, may not always be worth the same as a Euro at another bank. 
So our system, in fact, we tend to, to push the, the modeling to be, um, to have quite a lot of ledgers to represent all these different liabilities between these different issuers. But so, so let's say uh, I have some euros on, on my uh, bank ledger here in Germany and Sebastian has uh, some euros on his in France and now he wants to send me euros and I mean how do I know if I can trust those euros on some other ledger that you know I have no visibility into? And furthermore, how do I, how would I transfer euros from my ledger to his? Because from what yeah, I've done yeah. <laughs> playing with the command line tool, it's just a sort of basic the alpha version. It, it didn't, didn't appear that there was uh, inoperability between ledgers uh, where I could send. Yeah, in, assets from so in that command line alpha at the moment, there was, uh, uh, there is kind of, uh, it's possible, but it's it's not exactly uh, made user friendly. Um, so uh, in that situation, I mean, again, we're getting back to the, the state where we're kind of attempting to model, uh, you know, this, this stuff has uh, existing setups and existing structures. Um, so in this simple example, it would probably be that the banks maintain correspondent accounts with each other, Nostra and Bostra accounts. Um, and uh, in this situation, it would kind of go through, uh, it could be a, a single atomic process, let's say, if, they're, if, if it's all running within the same pool, let's say. Um, it could be a simple, single atomic process that I um, can transfer to the kind of, uh, to the credit, the, uh, the Nostro account of, well, it depends which way it's going around, but the Nostro bank of the, the receiving end, uh, who, with then instructions that that Nostro bank then credits um, the recipient at the other end. So. That's kind of how money moves around the system at the moment, except that it might take, uh, you know, when it goes to the uh, ACH systems, it can take, uh, you know, anywhere from a few hours to three days, depending on which jurisdiction you're in and which sort of clearing uh, um, ACH you're using. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's conceptually, it's, there, there, are, there are ways that this is set up already, um, and we're just looking at sort of uh, maybe, you know, making it very quick and easy to kind of model these existing setups. So, so let, let me be a, a bit uh, contrarian here and ask, the, I mean, it, it seems like what you guys are doing here is you, I mean, it sounds like you're just replicating the existing system, right? So how is, how is that better? Is it just a more, a more modern implementation of it that's much more efficient? Uh, yeah, as a starting point, we are trying to mimic the existing system um, as much as possible to make it easier for, for existing institutions to adopt. And there are you know reasons why the existing system is the way it is, uh, other than sort of you know long legacy reasons. Um, you know, as your point about transferring euros, uh, a euro has a counterparty, right? You're holding. It isn't just that you have a euro and it's a euro bill sitting in your pocket. That, that euro's counterpart is a European Central Bank, or if you've deposited in a bank, counterparty is the bank. Um, so, yeah, there are. You can't just sort of get around this when you're mapping assets on the ledger to the real world. They have to. They have to you know, follow some sort of structure, uh, which makes sense to represent what those assets are and, and who the you know whose liabilities they are to you as well. Um, so. Yes, it, it is very much trying to mimic the, the current system uh, and improve it and make it more efficient. Um, that is a starting point. I don't think we're going to see you know, central banks just sort of you know, give up and adopt Bitcoin. And um, you know, certainly Bitcoin will run in parallel to these systems, but we are very much trying to improve the, the current system whilst Bitcoin tries to revolution, well, replace it, uh, shall we say. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I, I have to say one of the things I, I really like about this that makes a lot of sense to me, and that's also one of the things I've been sort of struggling with and having doubts uh, regarding Bitcoin, is that with Bitcoin, right, we have this mining, right, and all these expenses to secure the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, and it doesn't, you know, the sort of security provided is the same regardless of for example, the value of the transaction, right? So I send uh, one euro to Sebastian. That's the same security backing that as if I was sending a hundred million dollars in a Bitcoin transfer, right? And that just seems kind of inefficient to me. I mean, uh, the only the only world in which I think this would make sense 
is if you can sort of get absolute security at no cost, right? Because then obviously you'd want to provide absolute security to everything. But as soon as sort of, you know, more security has more cost, then well, you think like, ah, in that, in that world, you would want to provide less security and have a cheaper system for those things that need less security. And That's a really great point. <laughs> yeah, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there with, with there is a sliding spectrum between you know, centralization and, and complete efficiency and lower cost and uh, complete and utter decentralization and you know, it being a slower system and more expensive system. Uh, so when you've got yeah, you know, if you've got a, a green grocer's trading you know, loyalty points, and you've got Apple issuing shares, that those two systems, you know, those two assets will, will cost the same uh, underneath, and have to go under both under the same uh, trade-offs between efficiency and decentralization. Uh, Hyperledger is very much designed to be you know, flexible, where a, a group of shops, say just in, in San Francisco, can set up a, a starts issuing a loyalty scheme, and that's just operated between themselves, and it's fast and um, and cheap to operate. Whereas if you want to have a, a global securities market and stock exchange, then you want to have much more uh, security over that network because the, the assets being traded on are so much more valuable. Well, this is all very interesting, and there's lots more to talk about. Before we do that, I'd like to give, take a break and talk about our sponsor, Shapeshift. So I challenge you to go out there and try to buy, take some Bitcoin and buy some Dogecoin and come back to me and tell me how long it took you to do that. It probably takes mm, anywhere between half an hour and an hour if you have to go through an exchange and create an account and get it verified and perhaps even send them some personal information to do that. Uh, well, there's an easier way, and that way is Shapeshift. You go to shapeshift.io and use their currency conversion tool to convert just about any coin into just about any coin. So you can convert Bitcoin into Litecoin. You can convert Litecoin into Dogecoin. You could convert unobtainium into uh, BitShares, for instance. Uh, so Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. They support about 25 different uh, coins, and they're adding new coins all the time. And you understood the best thing about Shapeshift is that you don't even have to create an account. You don't have to give them any personal information, not even an email address. They're, they just used a very simple currency conversion tool that I'll show you. Uh, and and it's uh, with no confirmations. Usually with an exchange, you have to wait for a few confirmations. Shapeshift does it unconfirmed. Exactly. So you go to shapeshift.io, and you use their currency conversion tool, which looks a lot like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. So you have the currency you want to convert. So let's say I want to uh, get some uh, name coin. So let's say I have Bitcoin, and I want to get some name coin. I, uh, I'll just put my Namecoin uh, payment address right here, hit start. I don't have a payment address right now, but uh, I would hit start. That would get a QR code. And uh, with that QR code, I'd send some Bitcoin, and I'd get some Namecoin in, what, about 30 seconds? Uh, just uh, the time for them to get the transaction and get zero confirmations, and that's it. So go to shapeshift.io, give it a try. Uh, tell us what you think, if you like it and uh, we'd like to thank them for the support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So, um, we've talked a little bit about uh, the issue of, uh, and the question of security and, and cost and decentralization. How does that work with Hyperledger itself? Is, is it also the case that as you perhaps scale the network because and, and scale the security requirement. Let's say you do that that example of a of a global stock market where you have a lot of requirements and maybe a, a fairly high degree of decentralization. Does that also, um, for example, impact performance in a negative way? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, we're we're working as much as we can to mitigate against um, against that too much. Um, but uh, yeah, broadly, the more widely distributed your nodes are, the more of them there are, and the more latency that there is between them, that is going to impact how quickly a transaction gets confirmed. Um, yeah, as I say, there are ways you can mitigate against it, um, but that that's a sort of that's a tension which I think will exist in any decentralized or distributed system. Um, so again, that's that's just another reason why we think that independent deployments of these pools makes a lot more sense because 
um, yeah, your your requirements for kind of uh, throughput may be, um, you know, it, at one extreme end, you may need all the machines in the same rack in the same data center. I mean, they could be technically operated by different service providers, but they need to have the highest level of kind of connectivity between them. Um, and then at the other end, you may get, you know, uh, something that looks a little bit more like Bitcoin with, with a lot of participants and kind of global distribution. Um, but, yeah, you're going to get a trade-off there in, in terms of performance. So, so are you saying then that just uh, are, are, are you are you saying that Bitcoin cannot be performant no matter what? Um, in its uh, there are lots of very clever um, proposals around. Uh, I, I'm I'm not too familiar with all of them, but you know around channels and um, I guess the whole side chains thing is another is another effort to kind of. Um, uh, tackle this kind of problem, but I mean, fundamentally, at the core of, of Bitcoin uh, is uh, it has to be each block has to be fairly slow and expensive to create, right? Because that's kind of the security model. Uh, if it was quick and cheap, then it would be too easy to attack a particular block. So um, I, I think inherently, that's 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 that just kind of feels inherent in Bitcoin to me that it's a kind of it's a slow, steady protocol which just keeps chugging along and doing what it does quite well. Um, but yeah, they've, they've made the trade-off already and, and uh, it's, it's a kind of one extreme end of the spectrum. So I presume still in, in this case it's going to be much, much, much faster and the performance is going to be much higher even in a decentralized system where you may have, uh, I don't know, let's say at the extreme case maybe a thousand different nodes that control the network. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the, the number of nodes is certainly going to have an impact. Again, it's um, you, it's the problem's kind of slightly limited by by the kind of the um, a kind of quorum threshold that you need. The number of nodes that need to respond. So the very slowest nodes on the network are not going to um, impact you too much, which is nice. Um, but there is still a kind of a degradation um, when you get up to to a, a lot of nodes, as well as a lot of data you need to store for all of the the um, the um, signatures that are coming back that are confirming each of these transactions. Now, touching on security, uh, so Hyperledger doesn't use any proof of work or uh, any of these others, sort of more, I guess, uh, traditional uh, uh, consensus algorithms in the space. Um, can can you talk about security and how uh, Hyperledger uh, assets are are secured and so, in what type of scenarios would there need to be coercion in order to uh, to um, uh, make an attack on the network? So yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say the more kind of traditional consensus algorithms. Obviously, the the space <laughs> of crypto consensus algorithms is what six years six years or so uh, old, and obviously, consensus algorithms outside of crypto go back a lot longer. So. Um, yeah, we actually um, our initial implementation is is built on um, a kind of a, a core protocol uh, in this field, which is practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, the first paper on it, I think, was published in '99 um, out of uh, MIT by um, I think it was uh, Castro and Liskov who published the paper. Um, so it's about what 16 years old now. Um, it's it's uh, I'd consider it a kind of a, a, at the root of a, a kind of a family tree of protocols which take that as their starting point and um, make slight modifications to it depending on the um, you know increasing efficiency in in particularly high latency networks or um, you know making it more robust uh, in certain failure scenarios and things like that. So um, there's a there's a kind of a, a broad pool of, of um, Protocols that we can we can sort of draw on here. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's quite different from Bitcoin. I mean Bitcoin came along and, and rejected a lot of the assumptions that were, were going on in uh, in consensus systems. Uh, and it's, I think there's been quite a lot of academic interest as well in in what Bitcoin has changed there. Um, but from the more uh, traditional consensus system uh, approach, we know that the the lower bound on uh, a number of identified um, when you've got a consensus system between a number of identified nodes, we know that the uh, the upper bound on malicious or um, uh, just failed uh, nodes in the system is one third. 
So we can tolerate up to, uh, over some given window, we can tel tolerate up to um, uh, one third faulty or malicious nodes. Um, and beyond with, that. With the practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Yes, yeah, like, correct. Up to one third. Yeah. So uh, beyond that, the system basically becomes unavailable. Um, and uh, we can detect that it's unavailable and we can, uh, we can, you know, you can have your alerting or monitoring tools uh, let people know that the system's not working for them to fix. Um, and beyond that, once you get up over two thirds, then you've kind of, uh, you know, which may be, say, malicious in this case, uh, then there are some attacks that could be done to, um, uh, to not include or um, order in a particular way the transactions. Um, although it we've seen consistently by the rest of the system, it could be um, kind of, you know, forcing some participants out or into kind of, uh, if they kind of order their transactions particular ways, it may be particularly unhelpful to them. Um, having said that, there is some uh, work that we haven't included yet, um, but there is some interesting work on increasing that, um, I mean, that, that uh, failure threshold is a third. I mean, that's a known lower bound uh, in these types of systems, a uh, known upper bound, sorry, uh, in these types of systems. And, uh, but there is some work that you can kind of then move in, depending on which operations you're trying to do, there is a, um, uh, there is a um, certain operations that you can take when the system's under attack or unavailable in some sense. There's still some operations that you can kind of push through. Um, but that's not an optimization that we've made at the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's still, uh, there's, I mean, there's no double spend at any point, right? The system either confirms a transaction um, or um, it's unavailable. So, uh, and in the, the severe case where it's kind of completely controlled by malicious nodes, again, there's, there's kind of no capability of double spend. They're just, all they can do is kind of uh, omit or reorder transactions to be a little bit um, less convenient. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's a slightly different setup from, from uh, Bitcoin, but uh, that's, uh, that's yeah. probably the... So, uh, one, one thing that's interesting here, so we, uh, I organized a Bitcoin meetup in Berlin, and uh, we had a talk uh, a few months ago uh, by a guy named uh, Trent. He does a startup in Berlin called Describe, and he comes from sort of a machine learning background, I think, and he's not, he's... I think he has quite a lot of experience with uh, technology, but not so much. You know, he doesn't come from the cryptocurrency space necessarily. And uh, he gave a talk on sort of coming from consensus systems and databases, because he was familiar with that. And he was like, why is nobody using this? And this specifically, he was talking about Paxos. He was like, it, it just like seems it would make so much more sense to me if somebody built a cryptocurrency based on that. And, you know, that would be so much more efficient, etc." And it seems like you guys are exactly doing that. So it's uh... yeah. I mean, that was that was kind of one of our. Um, I, I was really interested in the, the the kind of cryptocurrency space for a long time. Um, but yeah, one of my issues was it was with it was just the overhead of uh, all the mining and and kind of that there there were protocols out there which could solve this. Uh, having gone into it, you know, uh, as far as we have done now. You can you can understand why Bitcoin makes the trade-offs that it does. It's it's a really neat system when your starting assumption is that there are a lot of anonymous nodes who are kind of coming in and dropping out. Um, it's it's a it's a very clever system, and uh, there may be small tweaks and improvements that could be made to that core protocol. Um, but it, it, on the whole, it's been remarkably resilient and does what it does very well. But again, as we've as we've always said, if you've got a different set of starting assumptions. Then there's a there's a broad range of literature um, and you know a lot of academic research which has been done on this stuff um, to to draw upon. Um, it's you don't have to go back and, and reinvent this stuff, and you shouldn't because the minute you try and kind of reinvent these uh, consensus protocols from scratch um, without having you know a really good um, uh, grounding in this stuff, you're you're going to make um, you're going to make some errors or you're you're gonna. There will be some edge cases where it's where it doesn't work. So, uh, you know, practical Byzantine fault tolerance has a nice formal mathematical proof um, to show that it is correct. Um, so, you know, there there aren't too many consensus protocols which can make that same claim. So that's you know that's why we've we've uh, gone with that as our starting point. Today's magic word is ledger, L-E-D-G-E-R. 
go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Coming back to the attack scenario, so, you know, we're we're looking at something that's completely different than the Bitcoin network because we we have uh, no known nodes rather than uh, unknown nodes. So, g- given that in a scenario where someone's trying to ina- attack the network, would those nodes uh, be visible? Would be would we be able to identify the nodes that are uh, trying to attack the network? Yeah, you would. Every uh, uh, nodes have to are identified by their public key, and they sign any transaction that they're processing uh, according to this this protocol. So um, all of that information is broadcast to the other nodes and logged, made visible. So if so, there's very little incentive to attack the network. I mean, because first of all, you're we're, the assumption is that we're in a system where people are um, don't have the incentive to attack the network, and then on top of that, it would be known that they were attacking the network. Exactly. Exactly. So it's it's a fairly um, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there there could still be reasons why you'd why you'd want to, but it it certainly cuts it out to a certain extent. And can, can you go into some of those reasons? Like, because it's not it's unclear to me if you can't double spend. Like, it's unclear to me if there are any attack vectors that are actually plausible with this in in a type of scenario like what Hyperledger is trying to achieve. Well, again, being able to uh, to reject transactions, um, you know, if you have full control kind of above two-thirds or something of the network uh, and you can get to the point where the system can run but you're rejecting operations, then it may be that, you know, you're, you're looking to punish some particular actors in the system so that they just can't use it at all. Um, so, that, I mean, the incentives are, are reduced, but, I mean, there are still a few. So it also seems like one thing one could do, you know, because all the, the actors, uh, the agents can be known, is you could actually have legal contracts that sort of uh, say oh, certain actions and types of behaviors are illegal, no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a fallback, you're, yeah, you've, you've got the technical proof that people can't double spend. Um, but, for example, if, if Brian was sending Sebastian, you know, Brian had 10 units in his account and he was sending Sebastian 5, uh, and then he was also spent sending me 10, um, Daniel could, you know, depends on which one goes through first and which one gets confirmed. Um, if Daniel had over two thirds, or Daniel's group had over two thirds of the network, they could reorder that. So your transfer to to me went through, and then to Sebastian failed. Um, so that's one sort of reordering attack. But yes, you can have terms and conditions since everyone's known and the the the, the identity of the nodes are known. Um, you can have conditions to participate in that network, and as a fallback, you do have the legal system. Um, there will always be certain degrees of ambiguity um, over contracts in the world. I think they can't necessarily all be hard-coded and, and technically uh, solved. Um, so yes, having known identities means you can take traditional action for breaking terms and conditions and distributed agreements. I mean, that's we, we did uh, an episode recently where we talked about uh, your possible attack on Bitcoin, and uh, that's sort of one of the things that personally I find kind of um, uh, are worrying, and uh, that's uh, a possible scenario. So that somebody could attack Bitcoin, uh, and it would be perfectly illegal, right? Like, let's say somebody takes over a majority of the network and mines all empty blocks. That's a sort of a very simple attack we talked about. It's like, what's illegal about that? Nothing, right? Like, it, it would be, I think, impossible to get any kind of legal, uh, you know, lawsuit against a party like that. Uh, even if it, even if that party is known, right? But of course, here it's completely different. If you have a known set of nodes, you have a contract there that very clearly states the rules, and then they violate that, and you know you you have that as a basis. So it, it seems to have a, a quite an advantage there, also from a security perspective. Yeah, I think that yeah, in, in, in Bitcoin, things like fraud, fraud and theft would still be covered by you know, current laws. Um, but yeah, in the example you gave, that's you know, that there isn't really a current legal paradigm for a legal precedent for for something like that, uh, and it would be very very difficult to to have action. Um, so so yes, um, actually having you know, identities known, and and that's very important to the participants, not just for the legal background but if it, they want to know who's you know, who's processing the transactions and, and where they are um, if for example if you have a Bitcoin mine in North Korea 
uh, and they're process you know they're, they're running they're processing transactions and getting miners fees and you're paying those fees uh, are you and breaking sanctions and, and you know, breaking the law um, but uh, yes yeah, so in and actually having those identities and locations known that does mean there's there's legal recompense if, if someone does break those terms So diving into specific use cases, uh, I'd, I'd like to, so we, you know, we've talked about implementing this at sort of the banking, financial sector level. Um, I like to, I always like to have sort of simple examples. Uh, can you perhaps uh, explain a scenario where uh, someone might want to use this for loyalty points? Like, I don't know, maybe there's a local grocery store down the street and they want to implement loyalty points for their customers and uh, use a system like Hyperledger, how would they do that? Yep, so we're actually talking to a company who's doing just that uh, okay. in, in the Bay Area. Uh, so they've got a group of, of you know, small independent shops and chains and even some larger supermarkets who currently issue loyalty schemes. Um, so they're I, mean, I won't go into specifics so of their particular solution, but each, each business can have its own ledger or multiple ledgers. Um, so one, say, could be a USD uh, prepaid ledger. Another could be if they're spending to give them free, um, you know, free sandwich or whatever it may be. Uh, and then the, those businesses can receive the funds, issue onto those ledgers, issue their own those tokens, uh, and also group together to create you know interoperability and accessibility that you can have one loyalty scheme that can be used across you know everyone in Berkeley, for example. Um, so that would be you know an example where you've got a few smaller partners, not all of them necessarily have to run nodes. Uh, the attack you know, the security required is not as, as high as it would be with, with securities. Um, so they can all run their own you know, private pool uh, or have access to that data, but it could be you know, hidden from the public as to you know, which users have what, how much in their accounts, but all the businesses participating in that would be able to see and accept uh, the loyalty programs from, from, for themselves and for, for others that they've agreed to. So what would the advantage of a system like this be from a centralized system? I, I guess a centralized system you need to have uh, some party, maybe all these different stores would need to trust one and here uh, you would have sort of visibility between them or? Uh, yeah, so interestingly, they, they all do currently use a central party, uh, and in the, the typical Bitcoin world, people sort of think that, you know, we're trying to get rid of central parties, um, and it would be, so that the group of participants who are getting together to eliminate that central party. Uh, in this circumstance, it's actually the central party who's adopting Hyperledger um, to sort of disrupt themselves. Uh, they see that being a central party means that they have to operate their own database and accounting software, which can be very, very complicated. Uh, whereas, you know, essentially, uh, you know, outsourcing that to to a hyperledger pool and you know, getting all the benefits of our development automatically uh, without them having to build their own proprietary system. Uh, it also means that it's a lot more open to, to the ecosystem so people can build different types of tools on top that will be, if someone builds something, you know, some completely unrelated and open sources it, uh, they can make use of that and having that sort of shared you know, platform that everyone can build on top and, and share the ecosystem. Um, and also, yeah, for other types of assets, that it could be traded between you know, different pools, so you could change your. Uh, While well, they might be operating a, a you know, loyalty scheme pool, there may be an air miles pool that people can transfer across to, and it opens up the, the possibilities for um, you know, sort of liquidity in the market and exchanging these points for other things. Um, so they, they see a lot of value there and the, the future potential of, of having a you know, permissionless platform. Now, could 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 one use this? Perhaps for doing crowdfunding and issuing tokens, would would that even be desirable? Um, yep, you can do. Um, you know, in the case where actually they are, they are also looking into that that same company. Um, so you could crowdfund a new new restaurant or business. Um, you know, it, Hyperledger does very much take the starting assumption that you're not doing anything illegal. Um, if there's anything sort of legally gray area or, or blatantly illegal, then some Bitcoin-based solution probably is a, a you know better fit for that. Um, because of the decentralized aspect. Yeah, because yeah, they, they, 
you, you, that's why you want that you know higher uh, level of resiliency and decentralization um, and and reduce trust as much as possible. Um, but yeah, and, but certainly if you're you know, following regulations and you're um, you know, you're complying to local laws, then Hyperledger could be used for that. Uh, certainly, if there was there were no risk of attacks on that that scale. Well, it seems like in this case, it, it, even using a decentralized system is not going to help you in any way, right? Because it will always be known, you know, that that business here in San Francisco that did crowd sale is it's no problem for the government to just come in and like shut down that business, arrest people, etc. So whether or not like the share trading can still go on and they can't do that, it, it's fairly irrelevant, right? I mean, yep, and that's a great point. Whenever you're um, you know dealing with assets in the real world, and and what's on the ledger is actually mapping into real world assets, whether they're, they're gold or shares or, or anything else. Um, ultimately, governments can go and seize the you know, the way the gold's being stored or shut down the business um, or take whatever real world asset is is. You know, being being mapped. Um, so unless you have something where something on the ledger you know, is actually the asset that it represents, as Bitcoin is, uh, which has no counterparty, or you have shares issued directly onto that ledger that are the official record, um, which yeah, you know, things built on top of counterparty or bit shares uh, are. Um, but when you have a you know physical presence or a physical Commodity or item in the real world, you're never going to get around that just with a technical solution. Especially if you're in the US, right? I mean, it may help you if you're abroad, right? But uh, if you are where the law is going to be enforced, then that's not going to protect you. Yes, exactly. So, um, <laughs> Sebastian, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the technical implementation or? Should we uh, should we cover that briefly? Uh, yeah, I just I can't remember if we already talked about this before the show or during the show. <laughs> I think we talked about it before the show. So right, okay. Uh, so how how would a, a company implement a, a private pool? No, didn't we talk about this just a couple of minutes ago? I <laughs> guess. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah. So, how would a company implement? Uh, we kind of covered bits of it. At, at yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the the you know, code is more in detail about how how a company or a group of organizations would implement private pools. Right. So it's it's. Um, I mean, it's the the source code is is freely available. Um, it runs as a, a fairly standard web server. Um, you um, you have to set it up with an initial configuration of the the uh, other initial nodes to, to start with, um, and uh, yeah, from there you can you can uh, you can contact the nodes and, and start, uh, it'll start to replicate the system. Um, so um, yeah, I mean there's no need to, to fork the code or anything like that to uh, to set up your own unique configuration. It's kind of it's ready to go. Um, having said that, at the moment there's there's not a particularly um, user-friendly uh, onboarding process to get that up and running. So that's something we're going to work on very soon. Um, so that kind of when you when you start it, you will uh, be asked to to set up your initial configuration and all that. Um, yeah, and then and then the clients again connect just through standard HTTP messages. So um, we'll be releasing um, a couple of reference clients for that. Um, and there's a command line uh, implementation, um, and yeah, beyond that, it should be fairly simple and straightforward to integrate with uh, in a bunch of different ways. So anybody can do that right now. So right now, you go to the GitHub page, you can install the command line interface tool. Uh, it's just a Ruby gem, like, and then you can uh, create ledgers, you can create assets, you can issue them. It's running on a pool of nodes that you guys are uh, you guys have up right now, which is just basically yep. staging nodes. Yeah, um, okay. I think that's uh, I think that's still running on our alpha implementation, so that's shortly to be yeah. updated with a um, it, to be updated with our beta implementation, which is uh, a lot more robust uh, and should be a lot more performant. But uh, it'll it'll look pretty much exactly the same to begin with. So um, uh, and so the yeah. server side, the server side, when you're running a server, is you you're running a node uh, and and then you're so you're hosting the database uh, locally on on your system, and you you talk about web server. What does that web server output? Is it just 
is there an interface there? Is there what, what? Um, so at the moment it's just um, a JSON API, um, right. so designed for, for sort of uh, yeah, more like an API um, exposed over the, the web interface. But um, yeah, we will probably be working on some sort of administrative, um, I guess you call them kind of blockchain explorers or, or you know something like that. I was curious um, about that because I didn't them. see that anywhere in there and, and I was wondering right. if that was going to be part of the beta or even the final release was some sort of an explorer. Yes, yeah, I definitely, I, I, I think so. That's something we're, we're very keen to get in because, um, yeah, again, like with the setup, it'll just make it a lot easier to, uh, for people to get up and running with um, if they can go through and kind of see it all happening um, and, and get to grips with how the system is processing these transactions. Um, yeah, at the moment it is kind of exposed, but it's, it's just as an API, so we just haven't written the tool yet. And, and so it's the idea that then that, so you know, we'll have these private pools, most likely. You know, companies will onboard this and, and start using it. And then you may also have, uh, so I suppose the business model for Hyperledger, and we can talk about this a little bit for a few minutes afterwards, is that you guys would also propose uh, uh, pools. But then is the assumption that we'll just have people running Hyperledger servers out in the wild, and the so you you may have like maybe I don't know like 500 people running Hyperledger servers, and just anybody can create assets given that they have no specific you know, specific requirements for security. I don't know maybe I want to create an asset to trade things between like my friends and I. Um, is the assumption that there'll just be some servers out there in the wild? Uh, sort of. Do you mean as sorry? Public do you mean good. Access? Huh? Do you mean? Did you, did you mean kind of open access? That yeah, you don't open have access to service. Right, like right now, you have a couple right. of nodes out there uh, that people, yeah, can, yeah. people have created assets on. So yeah, we. Um, so I think we'll probably kind of uh, formally get that down as a, um, a, and kind of separate that staging environment probably um, into a, a test net where the information will probably be uh, wiped periodically, and then yeah, we'll work on a, a, a sort of a more public uh, implementation. Where uh, there will be probably some uh, it, the the public uh, pool will be a lot more open, um, but obviously uh, there'll be no guarantees of kind of right. quality or performance because we can't necessarily you know guarantee that it'll be running on the highest quality infrastructure. Um, but that that yeah, we're planning to get a, a public implementation is up as up as well. Okay. So. Um in this world in the future, right, where we have like a tons, tons of different ledgers, I mean, I, I think one interesting thing to come back to is the question like, what will that feel like and look like when you actually interact with that, right? So obviously wallets are going to be essential and uh, I presume we will see wallets, right, that handle a lot of things. So, you know, they may have Bitcoin in it, maybe fiat currency and, you know, maybe a whole bunch of also, let's say, hyperledger uh, assets. Um, how would that work, sort of from a from a on a wallet level? How would that be implemented? Would that be complicated to get each wallet, to, you know, let's say, understand five different um, hyperledger consensus systems and to know actually I I've received the transaction now and it's valid? Because it seems like that's one of the advantages of of some of the Bitcoin-based solutions, right? Because it will be perhaps easier to build those things. Well, I'd say, I mean, on, on one level, uh, between Bitcoin and ourselves, well, there are some definitely some, some large differences in how the consensus process works. The, um, the whole kind of public key infrastructure, you know, the idea of creating your own local, um, you know, key pair and, uh, and using that or multi-sig to authenticate transactions, all of that stays um, very, very much the same um, or kind of as, as similar as, um, as we can. Um, so, I mean, from the wallet point of view, in terms of key management and signing transactions and submitting transactions, all of that um, look, looks very similar. Um, so there may be some slight differences in the API, uh, although we'll probably release uh, probably a sort of a Bitcoin D wrapper so that we, we are as kind of drop-in compatible with kind of existing Bitcoin uh, implementations as possible. Um, on the other side, I'd say, you know, if they, if they are going to extend specific support for Hyperledger, then um, it should be um, fairly straightforward, given that, that your starting assumption is that there are multiple pools out there that, um, you know, you would, you would assume that the, the wallet um, creator has uh, some sort of way to 
say which particular pools I want to to add. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a member of, and, and you know, given my public keys here, look up my addresses on these different um, pools. So um, yeah, I mean, conceivably, there's we could even have some sort of uh, global, uh, if you wish, kind of public name registration system, which would kind of look like the domain name system or something like that. So that if I did want to check which, given a public key, which which kind of pool is this on. Um, there's conceivably something we could do there, but um, I'd say that's a little bit further off. Okay, great. Well, let's let's spend a few minutes before we we dive a bit a bit more into the Hyperledger project itself to to hear a bit about sort of your vision of the cryptocurrency ecosystem of the future. Um, where do you see this going and where do you sort of see the, the place of Hyperledger in that? Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, I don't think Bitcoin will, will go away and we're certainly not trying to replace it. So I do see that still remaining a currency, um, particularly on the currency side, uh, as a niche, but as a very large niche. Um, you know, the, the three and a half billion dollars as it is is still still absolutely tiny. Uh, I think that will grow regardless of the success of other projects. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah, there being multiple pools and, and probably multiple protocols for different use cases. Uh, if you want something which is completely trustless, um, you know, entirely where you don't trust anyone and you don't want anyone to know who you are, then something like Bitcoin or, or Dash dot coin. Um, will you know, still have a place, um, but in terms of sort of in institutional users or companies who have to operate under certain conditions uh, and need to have you know, identity, uh, need to know who they're operating with and where they're uh, where the, the nodes in that network are, um, there will be you know, a variety of sort of private implementations and, and inter-private yeah, inter uh, uh, pools. Um, so. I can see you know, financial institutions adopting something like Hyperledger between themselves for, say, trading. They may be adopting Ripple for the, the payments or correspondent banking side. Um, I can't see you know, the existing large incumbents adopting something as revolutionary as Bitcoin and Bitcoin-based platforms um, in the near future. And I can't see it eating into their, their current business that much in the, the near future. But you know, potentially you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, it's hard to predict. Uh, but I definitely do see a world where there are multiple different protocols and um, platforms for, for different scenarios. Um, and that, yeah, there will be the ability to be interoperable and move between them. Um, but whether that is desired or not is, remains to be seen. And, and what's your view of the sidechains project? Because that also seems to kind of offer this perspective of having, you know, custom, customized uh, chains for all kinds of use cases. Yeah, it's a very interesting project, and um, you know, remains to be seen that you have to get it implemented, but it, it probably will. Um, the the questions that we have are, are that when we get asked about it from banks, is that they're in interested in this idea of uh, private chains or yes, side chains, uh, but they don't necessarily need that, that two-way federated peg to Bitcoin because there isn't really the interest in moving in and out of Bitcoin. Uh, that to me seems more like a, you know, going backwards from the starting point of Bitcoin to make it fit into that world, uh, whereas we've just started in that world to start with and are building a solution for that world. Uh, so I think that's actually sort of happening across the board in Bitcoin generally. Um, there's, you know, you, you've got the sort of libertarian crypto enthusiasts initially and there's more business and, and banking people move into the space, they're trying to rein it back in and that's creating a bit of a conflict within the Bitcoin world. Um, but yeah, trying to use something, trying to use Bitcoin for something it wasn't designed with, but designed for in the first place might you know, present quite a lot of issues and, and doesn't actually necessarily bring the benefits of the reasons why people want those things in the first place. Um, so I'm not convinced that having a two-way peg with Bitcoin actually adds a lot of value to institutions adopting it, uh, more so it adds value to Bitcoin by having the ability to do those things. Um, yeah, so, so it's a pro-Bitcoin move rather than a pro-customer move. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've talked a bit about uh, 
what you may be envisioning as, as part of a business model. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on uh, how you guys plan to make money in the future? Yep. Um, so yeah, as a, as a young startup, it is still evolving, and anything we say now will probably be different next week. But um, uh, essentially, yeah, Hyperledger is going to be completely open source. Uh, we don't want to monetize the protocol, no cryptocurrency built in, so anyone is free to take that, use it. They don't need to fork it or do anything. They can just do what they like with it. Um, so once that is, you know, becomes more of a standard and there is a more widespread adoption from the, the people we're speaking to at the moment, uh, there's plenty of opportunity to provide higher level uh, products and, and support services uh, around that. Um, so if there's a, a particular say and then derivatives which can be very you know, complicated uh, and need a lot of customization something that doesn't apply to the general platform um, we may you know, build proprietary solutions on top of the, the open source hyperledger base specifically just for that particular use case and, and license that to, to institutions um, we can provide support and customization uh, to them uh, we are also looking for, for companies that want to set up a yeah, consensus pool themselves, but don't necessarily want to run the infrastructure themselves. Um, you know, we're looking at more of a sort of cloud utility model, where we can have a a marketplace of authorized, verified Hyperledger providers that we've actually done tests on, um, and they can select. Say, I want to have a maximum of three nodes operated per per entity, per company. Um, I want them all inside the EU, um, and I want them all to be. You know, and data centers which are compliant for this and that and that. Uh, and then they can just spin up a pool as large as they want um, across the, the existing Hyperledger providers and, and pay on a per node basis, um, of which we would we would take a cut in order to provide that, that verification and marketplace uh, functionality. So that's a sort of consensus as a service angle uh, for the smaller to medium-sized companies. Cool. cool. Very interesting. And uh, what about timeline? Uh, so you, I mean, there is some type of release here, but um, what do you envision happening in the next 12 months? Uh, so yeah, the alpha was released last July. Uh, that was always you know, designed to be you know, just a test, and then we always planned to throw that away. Uh, so the, the beta is actually up on GitHub now. It's been completely rewritten from scratch. It's uh, much more performant and stable. Uh, and the goal is to have that production ready by early April, uh, just with the, the core feature set. Um, beyond that, you know, it is very much market driven. Um, from the, the customers we're talking, or the potential customers we're talking to, uh, there are specific requirements and weighing up which of those are you know most generally applicable uh, to go across the, the board. Um, we will get the highest priority. So. Um, we, we will have a proper sort of feature map and roadmap up soon, uh, but it will you know, likely change based on, on user feedback very rapidly. Cool, fantastic. Well, um, thanks so much for, for joining us today, guys. It was, uh, it was very interesting talking about this project, which uh, I think is, is definitely showing uh, an important, an important sort of movement that's happening in the, in the cryptocurrency space or the attempt to, to take a lot of the innovation and a lot of the sort of breakthroughs that have happened here and, and try to apply them to existing systems and see what one can sort of do with that. I, I, my, my thoughts on this is that you know we're finally starting to see some real world applicable uh, Infrastructure that can be used for business, and you know, people will uh, will look at that. Uh, some people, you know, will look at that as uh, not necessarily as progress, but as going in some direction that uh, is contrary to the belief of Bitcoin and the other sort of the essential ideological ideas. But you know, when it comes down to it, you know, this is uh, what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to implement um, decentralized and somewhat distributed technologies in, into everyday life so any anything that we can do to um, enable that for businesses is I think a step in the right direction yeah absolutely I mean they're, they're not mutually exclusive um, exactly you know, you can, right you so can yeah. jump ahead and then try to create the perfect world um, which is a you know, perfectly reasonable thing to do um, or you can try and take the existing world and you know, bump it in that direction more slowly so um, you know, different approaches they can run completely in parallel we're not harming the, the Bitcoin world or Bitcoin's chances of success because the 
people we're talking to aren't going to use it anyway. Um, so yeah, you know, just we can you know bump the uh, Bitcoin can sort of break through the the, the current um, current system, and we can as as it does, we can sort of bump up behind it and try to push it and make it more efficient and more usable and bring you know, a lot of benefits to, to consumers at the same time. Absolutely, and and one of the positives for Bitcoin may also be that you know once uh, there's of course a much much higher extent of interoperability when you start having hyperledger and those kind of systems for some assets, let's say it's fiat currency or whatever, uh, with Bitcoin than with existing systems, right? Because existing systems they're just completely incompatible, and uh, so I think there's a lot a lot to be said for that, and that also offers a lot of uh, possibilities for Bitcoin. Yep, it's still pushing the the other. Uh, the pri uh, public private secret uh, public private key um, infrastructure. Um, so once that is, you know, and that's a big thing, not just for the Bitcoin world, but for the internet and, and banking and everything in general. So helping push that forward uh, as a you know, greater industry is, is beneficial to everyone who's who's using that technology. Uh, and as you say, it does make it easier for people to you know, once they are used to. You know, being in control of their own assets and having those those private keys, and that makes the, the jump to Bitcoin all the more more uh, palatable. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. It was a it was a pleasure. We will have links to to the project, also to to your forum and and to the blog, perhaps where people can read more about the project. Also, get in touch with you guys uh, if they're curious. And yeah, I encourage people to, you know, if you if you're comfortable with the command line, like install the command line tool. It's really easy, and uh, you know, try creating a a ledger and assets and, and fooling around with it. Um, it's really cool. Absolutely, I should do that as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll try that as well. Okay, well, thanks much, um, and thanks to listeners for listening. It was a it was a pleasure as always. Uh, you can follow us at twi on Twitter at with Epicenter BTC. And uh, we will be back next week. So thanks, and we'll see you then. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much, guys.